Alrighty, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for uh, Zero to Hero. I believe this is session four. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for making it tonight. Uh, we've got Nick, and Nick is going to be doing a, a general presentation regarding how to set up a DHCP server and then how to also kind of debug some common errors. Uh, so we'll break it on purpose, and then we'll kind of go through the process of debugging it. Uh, before we begin, I did, uh, I know that there was a, a um, something that I'd been kind of tracking for a little bit. If you've ever done anything within the virtual learning environment, so let's say that you see something like this, where uh, you've got this little scroll bar on the sides and it's a little bit of a pain in order to really do anything. Uh, I know I, I especially it frustrates me. If you wanna stop that from happening, you can go here on the left. Uh, so there's this little um, pop out. I don't really know how to else to describe it, but you can go ahead and click on that and go on down to settings and go to scaling mode, local scaling, and it'll go ahead and fix it for you. So that's just as a note there. Um, I know it's it's kind of perplexed me for a while in terms of how to fix that, but we have a solution now in case you're working in the, in the online learning environment and you're like, darn it, I wish I wish this wasn't a scroll thing and I just had the, the machine available to me. So I thought I'd share that real quick just to kind of get that out of the way. I'm sure, I'm sure some of you maybe have figured had figured that out ahead of time, but for those of us that that hadn't really kind of explored around with the options that we had, um, there you go. There's your answer. So just thought I'd lead out with that this evening. Uh, and without further ado, uh, Nick, if you're ready, I'll go ahead and leave the floor to you. Uh, let me go Absolutely. ahead and enable sharing. Uh, there you go. Thank you, David. All right, so as David uh, mentioned already, uh, this is gonna be a presentation on DHCP. I'd like to start it off with a very brief PowerPoint, basically just going over what that actually means. So let me just share the screen. All right. Can you all see this? Not yet. It might be loading in. Give me a sec. Not there yet. Uh, is it showing up? Is I'm going to guess it's showing up that it's sharing on your end there, Nick. Yeah, let me try it again here. Yeah. Ah, there, there we, we go. go. Now it's going. All right. All right. So uh, dynamic host name configuration protocol is based around this entire concept of IP address. So uh, an IP address is you know, not dissimilar from a physical address that you have at your house. If I ever wanted to send a letter to David, uh, now if we're in the same room, I mean, that's easy enough. I can just hand it to him. Uh, there is something similar or like this in computer networks in which different devices can easily identify each other, um, known as MAC addresses, media access control addresses, and they're unique to each and every, sort of, at an abstract level, there's essentially a unique MAC address to every single device, and they can use a protocol known as ARP to try and discover, you know, if they don't know, they can just ask the network, and because it's a local network, or as we're in the room, uh, you can think about that, me saying like, hello, David, where are you? And David raises his hand, and I can give him a letter if we're in the same room. But that really doesn't work at any scale larger than that. And so we have to come up with some system of making sure data can get from point A to point B. And that's the IP addressing system. Uh, an IP address is four numbers. It's uh, eight bits each. So it can be from zero to 256, which it... Uh, you know, you can see it represented on the right here, both in decimal notation, base 10, uh, the normal numbering system we're all used to, and binary, in which the only possible digits are zero and one, uh, which is how computers, of course, communicate, because they can only communicate with itself using an on or an off, or a more power, less power, or something along those lines. Uh, now, theoretically speaking, if it's an addressing system, much like your home address, uh, each address should be unique. Unfortunately, uh, it isn't. Uh, IPv4 was designed at a point in time when they assumed only about a million devices or so were going to be connected to the network. So they created a system with an address space, or the amount of total possible IP addresses you can actually give if you were to go from zero to 100% of them, uh, at about 4 billion. 
they figured four billion will be more than enough to cover for the probably maximum one million devices that are be going to be connected to the internet. Uh, and then currently there's six billion devices that are trying to connect to the internet. And so this presents a problem for numerous reasons, as you might imagine, uh, but there are a few ways that we get around this. Uh, one of the ones that we're not gonna talk about too much today is known as IPv6. It's the basic concept is pretty simple. They basically just add more to the address. So there's more address spaces. So instead of 32, I, 32 bits, I believe it's off the top of my head, 128. Um, don't quote me on that though. I don't know the specific number of bits in an IPv6 address, but it is much larger. And I believe it contains enough address space to give every single atom in the observable universe its own address. And so they're not concerned about that one running out of space. But unfortunately, so much of internet architecture and computer networks are already built with V4 in mind. So, you know, we also have to figure out a solution for how do we work with IPv4? And that's primarily network address translation. And this is kind of why DHCP is important. Network address translation basically means that an entire network of computers can share one actual IP address and then just branch out by copying their own IP address, you know, just making up their own IP addressing systems, using private networks, um, in a way that's not dissimilar from the fact that your actual street address, you know, 3201 South Street, 8 Main Street, 9 Milk Street, right, probably isn't actually unique to the United States or the world, but it is unique to your town, your zip code, which is why, you know, 3201 South State Street, 60616 would be different than any other zip code, like the one, I don't know, 3201 South State Street in Houston or New York. Now, DHCP comes in because trying to manually assign an IP address to every single system in a system that, by definition, needs to be flexible enough to deal with the fact that there's not, a, that they have to be very careful with how long they're giving out IP addresses and where and who to, they give them to. Uh, and there were previous protocols like this, such as uh, Bootstrap, but um, they needed a better system. And so in the 1980s, this uh, protocol known as Dynamic Host Name Configuration Protocol developed. Uh, it's a very flexible program that allows you to dynamically address some amount of IP addresses at really any level. So at our private network, uh, we might use a DHCP addressing system to easily identify you know, these workstations will rotate through however many IP addresses they need, bearing in mind that we might need more or less depending on the time of day. If you walk into your place of work with a cell phone connected to their Wi-Fi, your cell phone's gonna need an IP address. And so DHCP is able to provide it. Or if you bring in a new laptop, or if your laptop breaks down and you need to buy another one, or any number of reasons, or if a computer goes down, you don't necessarily lose the address because it'll come right back to the DHCP system. Uh, it can also help control how long an IP address is given out. Uh, so, you know, it's not necessarily keeping an IP address for something for a laptop that doesn't need it, right? Using that example, you know, you have your IP address, you go into work, you use it for the day, but you go home at 5 p.m. They don't need to keep posting your IP address to your system. They can and just assign it to something, some other computer that needs it. And so DHCP is really responsible for simplifying IP management and allows for a flexibility that wasn't seen in previous systems. And so, uh, I mean, that's really the basics of it. Past that, I just want to get straight into the lab here. Uh, DHCP is going to be a lot simpler, more straightforward to set up than if you were here two weeks ago. Yeah, two weeks ago for our DNS lab it tends to be a little more straightforward. So we'll move to our lab environment. And just to introduce it, we have our DHCP server running on Debian Linux. We have a workstation here. Now this workstation is running on Ubuntu. It's just a basic desktop version of Linux that is meant to sort of emulate, well, I mean, there's a thousand reasons for any Linux distribution, but one of the reasons behind Ubuntu is to emulate a workstation a la Windows 10. And then we have what's known as a NAS or network attached storage. Basic concept behind network attached storage is pretty simple. 
it's storage you attach to a network that you can access anywhere on the network. Um, now I've already logged into uh, these hey, machines. Nick, just a quick, uh, uh, are you are you trying to share the uh, another screen there? Because you're still on the PowerPoint. Whoops. Yeah, you're good. There we go. All right. Sorry, as I was saying, we have our DHCP machine running on Ubuntu, or sorry, running on Debian. We have a workstation running on uh, Ubuntu. And we have this network attached storage. Uh, it's running on sort of a slightly modified version of still Debian. Uh, we're using what's known as Open Media Vault. Uh, this is an open source network attached storage solution, primarily geared towards movies, video, uh, audio, photos, that sort of deal. But what this allows us to do is, you know, store things that will be accessible from anywhere on the network. So if we were to use the example of a small business, let's say you're a media editing company, right? It'd be insane to have each and every single person only have all of their work saved locally to their machines, because A, and what if you need someone from somebody else? Uh, what if you need some, you know, if you're working in media, you probably need to collaborate a lot to make sure it all comes together as you intend for it. Uh, if that person's out sick, if that person's just do already busy, I mean, they can't take the time to transfer their files over to you manually. Um, what if they quit? What if something happens? What if their laptop breaks? And so network attached storage is used to facilitate a common area for storing things for further access. Now, uh, just for the credentials here, let me throw those in chat. Uh, the initial network attached storage machine is going to be admin and NAS. The workstation of Mr. Desk Desmond's Katap is desktop desktop. And the DHCP machine here, it's going to be fairly straight. I mean, DHCP admin, DHCP admin. While, of course, you don't want simple passwords, because this is a lab environment, I figure it's easier just to simplify the process here. So with that out of the way, uh, what we want to do is have it so that the network attached storage is always going to be at the same IP address so that we don't have to worry about that changing us. We want it to be the same. We want one IP address that everyone can remember, everyone in the company can access, and we're not gonna have to keep checking it constantly. But with a workstation, we want that assigned dynamically. We, you know, If it's a laptop, you'll imagine, uh, that might leave, that might come back, they might change laptops, they, you know, whatever, right? They might bring their phone. We want that, we don't want that stuck to a single IP address, we wanna be able to, Take that back, give it back, uh, give it to somebody else. And so uh, we have this DHCP machine that's going to be able to do all that. Now we've already installed DHCP, the uh, DHCP server that we're going to be using. It's known as ISC-DHCP-server. Uh, we can check, I believe it's apt get version or apt get dash v. And you can see, ah, it's giving us the version for apt, which is our package manager. Ah, well, you'll have to trust me that it's installed. Uh, now, when we installed it, it's not going to run because it doesn't actually know how to run because we haven't set any of the configurations for it. Uh, we're going to need to know a few things about this machine and the machines we actually want to you know, supply with uh, IP addresses. And so in order to do that, we're going to use uh, just the IPA command. 
If you used ipconfig, this is pretty much the same thing. It's just a more updated version of the package that you'll find on more, you know, more commonly on most systems. And you'll notice here that under underneath our network interface, our ENS18, we don't actually have an IP address for uh, the DHCP machine. And if we go into the others, you'll also not find one for those as well. None of these machines have an IP address at this moment. Now, again, we could manually go into the machine and change it to have its own uh, IP address. But as we've discussed, that would be kind of messy. You know, it'd be uh, difficult to manage, difficult to really monitor, and it could cause all sorts of problems. So instead, we are going to assign a static IP to the DHCP server and let the DHCP server deal with everything else. So in order to access the D, you know, change the DHCP server's IP address, uh, we'll go into, we'll use the nano, N-A-N-O, uh, web editor. You can use whatever you like, but I find nano to be probably the easiest for myself personally. But there's also, I believe, B and B I M installed on the machine. And we're going to go to slash etc slash hmm wait yeah slash interfaces and you're going to see this is uh, just a basic uh, configuration file for setting the IP address of the machine. Now, currently, it's basically looking to the greater Proxmox environment to give it a DH to give it an IP address, uh, but we're not giving it that. You'll see DHCP at the end here. So we're going to change this to more or less just tell itself what its IP address is. So the first thing we're going to change this first line on the primary network interface to auto, whatever it is. And in our case, it's ENS eighteen. And we are going to change DHCP into static, telling our machine that it has a static IP address. Now, uh, we really can do pretty much whatever we want specifically for the IP addressing, uh, but there, there are a few common standards, a few specifically reserved private networks. So we'll go with one of those and we'll set it to what? 192.168. We'll go with dot one dot one for our our for our IP address. So we'll save and exit. And permission is denied. I my apologies. You will have to be uh, an elevated, you know, a root user in order to access this. So you'll SU. In this case, the root user's password is the same as the primary, you know, DHCP admin account, which you shouldn't do normally. But again, we're sharing passwords and using simple passwords because we understand that we shouldn't normally, be in an actual environment, be using simple passwords, and that this is just for the purpose of the lab. So the password is DHCP, and you can see here we are root at DHCP machine instead of DHCP admin at DHCP machine. So once again, nano slash act slash network slash interfaces. Change this to auto and change from DHCP to a static 192.168.1.1. Save and exit. Now, if we change it, it's still not actually going to change because we need to restart the networking service. We can do that with the system control, the system CTL commands. Uh, system CTL. Restart networking.
and the networking service fails. Hmm. And it's telling us there's a, there's an important option with an empty value over here. Uh, if up slash X slash network slash interfaces line 13 option with empty value. So let's open that back up. You can hit the up arrow to just revisit old commands you've used. And what is the empty? It might be address and then the IP address, Nick. I believe you're correct. My apologies, it'd just be address and then the IP address to signify what exactly the number you're typing in is. Control S, Control X. And restart networking, pass with, uh, you know, without failing. We'll do IPA. Hmm. And it's still not providing us with an IPv4 address. There we go. I just restarted networking again and 192.168.1.1 in our ENS18 network interface. And just a little bit on network interfaces. Basically, you know, uh, some co device computer has a way of connecting to a network. Uh, on your average laptop, you'll have two, your wireless, you know, network, your wireless network interface card that connect with Wi-Fi, uh, as well as an Ethernet port, if you have it on your laptop or PC or, you know, any other computer computing device. In this case, ENS18 is referring to the fact that this is a virtual machine. And so the network interface is a, you know, a little strange and is, uh, ENS18 is uh, basically what Proxmox is giving us for the machine's network interface. Because again, it's not a physical machine. It's running on physical hardware, but it is you know, contained in another greater OS. All right, with that out of the way, let's actually get around to configuring our DHCP server. So the first thing we're going to configure is the uh, dhcp.conf file. So once again, using nano, we'll go into the file slash etc slash dhcp slash dhcpd for daemon with again a daemon being a program in linux that is just running in the background you hear daemon just think program in the background uh, you'll see it all the time when you're dealing with services because services are also typically running in the background and we'll have that d signifying daemon it's more or less just a standard of convention into the dhcpd.conf file now all of this was actually already created during our installation of the uh, ISC-DHCP server package. Uh, so when we open it up, you'll notice there's already things in here. Uh, if you remember from the DNS uh, week, if you were here for that, we didn't really have uh, an example to guide us, which was frustrating to say the least. ISC-DHCP-server. Uh, we are very glad. Uh, gives us this example file to you know work off of. Now we're going to go through here and we're going to see a few things here. Option domain name and domain name servers. Now these are you know internet domains, wikipedia.org, google.com, iit.edu. We don't have one and we're not planning to install a DNS server necessary to sort of create one and certainly not register with any sort of internet governing authority to actually get it available on the internet. So we'll just comment these out. It's fine for you know a private local network like ours. We're gonna see next these default lease times and max lease times. This is how uh, this is part of how DHCP manages IP addresses. A lease is basically just the IP at 
the uh, DHCP server saying, you can have this IP address for this long. Uh, at, after 600 seconds, you know, we'll check in again. After 7,200 seconds, we're going to revoke this lease, no matter what. Uh, then there's this dynamic DNS update style none. Uh, dynamic DNS is basically a way that DNS works very intrinsically with DHCP. You don't necessarily need it in either DHCP or DNS, so still work fine. But um, again, we don't have a DNS server, so we'll comment that out so the machine doesn't read it. Now, you'll see this very basic subnet declaration. And I just like to talk about subnet subnetting for a little bit, uh, because you might remember we talked about that there's not actually enough IPv4 addresses. And so we have to essentially make a branch of the greater internet with in which we just ignore every other IP address so that we can actually use IP addresses normally or use sp specially reserved IP address ranges that are only there for private use. Um, you can think about it a bit like, you know, 3201 State Street brings you to the mail room at IIT, but it doesn't actually tell you who is where. Uh, Subnetting can help, you know, decide this person is over in Gonzales. They're over in MSV. They're over in Carmen, uh, as dictated by the school or the network administrator who actually designs the system that is connected to 320, the 3201 South State Street mail system or the IP address DHCP system. Um, and so we're going to uh, declare a subnet for our workstations. And so we're going to uh, uncomment all of this out. We're going to change what's there. to a range for our own workstation purposes and services. So we were using that 192.168.1 subnet or you know one network for the uh, to actually assign the IP address to this DHCP machine. And that IP address of that network interface has to be in at least one of the ranges. You know, DHCP essentially has to be able to identify itself. And so we'll give it 192.168.1.0. And we're going to apply a net mask. Now, what that means is uh, basically the net mask is this. It divides what part identifies the network versus which part is actually just identifying the host. So here, it states 255 numbers of the first number, uh, up to 255 of the second number, and up to 255 of the third number. Ignore that. That's not going to help help you find what you're looking for. That's going to help you find the network. Uh, and we have that dot zero to signify those last number, the entirety of it. You know, that's that will identify your host for you. All right. And we'll set its range here for what we're actually going to give out to our workstations. 192.168. We'll start dot one dot fifty. You know, just to make sure we're not actually conflicting with the DHCP service address. To 192.168.1.100. We give it, you know, some amount of IP addresses. This basically means we can dynamically allocate from 192.168.1.50 to 192.168.1.100. So if we want to give out .75, .68, .99, we can. But we're not planning to give out .101. We're not planning to give out .49. And we're certainly not planning to give it out anything outside of this 192.168.1 range. Now you'll see this uh, option routers. Uh, currently, it's pointing to domain names, which again, we don't have a domain, so you know, we have to replace it with an actual IP address. And we're going to point it to the actual DHCP server. Uh, now, the DHCP server isn't really a router, but uh, it's basically asking where is it going to find information about the IP addresses. 
which the DHCP server can provide. So 192.168.1.1. Now there is something down here that we'd like to see. If you'll remember from our example, we want to give that NAS box its own permanent IP address. We don't want that IP address to change. We don't want to have to con continuously check and memorize and communicate what's NAS box's IP address. And if you actually go down in the example file, you'll see an example of a fixed address right here. I'll uncomment this out. It uses this Fantasia example. It gives something called a hardware ethernet and then a random string of numbers and letters and a fixed address, which again is currently set to a domain name. We don't have a domain. We're gonna to have to change that to an IP address. So what does all of this mean? So host basically is just giving us uh, some specific host. So instead of Fantasia, we'll say NASBox because we're trying to give the NASBox its own static IP. And what is this hardware ethernet random thing number? Uh, this is what we were talking about earlier, the media access control address, the MAC address. Uh, it's useful for finding things on a local network that the DHCP is going to be on, but we can't use it for the wider internet. But here, I mean, we absolutely can. We just got to figure out what is the MAC address of the NAS box. Once we have the NAS box's MAC address, that's not going to change. We can use it to identify which computer is the NAS box and which computer to give whatever IP address we want to give to it. Uh, we'll start by just giving it the address we want to give it. Now, because we're giving you know, dot .50 to dot .100 to assorted workstations that are be coming and going into our business, we'll give this one something below that 50 line. Reserve some amount of the space just for specific networking configurations. So 192.168.1.10. We have dot one for the DHCP server, dot 10 for the NAS box. It works well enough. And now we got to figure out what is the MAC address of the NAS box? Because that was just some random string of gibberish. It wasn't actually anything in particular. So we'll go over to the NAS box. You're going to log in and once again, uh, the credentials for that are in the chat. It should be admin NAS, you know, admin as a username, NAS, all in capitals, as a password. And again, if we type in IP, IP space A, thank you, David, we'll get this uh, sort of output. And we can see ENS18. That's the network interface we're working with. And you know, just for reference, this LO, this first one, that's loopback. So what that's doing is just pointing to the computer itself. It's a computer pointing to itself. It's um, used for the computer needs to test its own systems, it might ping itself, uh, it might ask itself questions, but this is, everything here is just pointing from the computer to itself. The ENS18 is the one we're concerned with because it's one that actually leads to the rest of the network. So let's look. We see this address here, 96D47BFA8ED4. That doesn't really look like a number. It looks like a bunch of numbers and letters. However, it's actually very similar to the IPv4 address's layout. It's number dot number dot number dot number dot number dot number except it's presented in hexadecimal, which is base 16. And so they go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, and then they just go A, B, C, D, E. And so they just use letters as digits higher than nine, but not quite 10. So we see this, we'll just copy it over. Uh, unfortunately, we can't easily copy paste in Proxmox, very sad but we can easily just switch between the two. What is this, 96D4? 96D4. Seven BFA. And it will be different for all of you um, because again, you know, different machines. Just type what you see. 
I believe that is an eight, eight E D four. D4. All right. And so now we have the dynamic host name we're going to be presenting to the workstations and the static host name we're going to be presenting to the NAS box. Now that box is actually still going to have to go through the basic lease processing. It's just going to be giving its own little, hey, tell me what my IP address is and the DHCP server, instead of giving it whatever is available, just gives it this one every single time. If it can't give it this one, it doesn't give it any at all. And so we'll, uh, we'll save this file, control S, control X if you're in nano. If you're in Vim, it'd be escape colon VI, or sorry. I am forgetting my VI commands. Escape colon WR. All right. With that out of the way, there is still things we're gonna to need to change here. Uh, that's basic configuration of what the DHCP server wants to do, uh, but we also gotta cover you know, how it understands itself a little bit more. And so we need to go into nano, if I can type it in correctly. Nano, again, use whatever text editor you'd like slash etc that etc these are going to be files once again that we're going to change semi-regularly but not all the time you know it's not changing as part of the program it's typically going to be things like configuration files as you just saw from the slash at uh, slash dhcp slash dhcpd.com slash at and we're going to go into the defaults uh, directory or default, my apologies, not defaults. And in there, there's going to be something just for the ISC DHCP server. Again, the ISC DHCP server, this sort of page was put there by the installation we ran. And we open it up, up again, and wouldn't you know it, thank goodness, it gives us an example that we don't have to try and replicate ourselves. Excuse me, that we don't have to try and replicate ourselves without any assistance. So the first thing we're gonna do here, we see interfaces V4, interfaces V6, and everything else is commented out. Interfaces V4 is covering IPv4 addresses, V6 is IPv6 V6 addresses. You'll remember, we talked a little bit about IPv6, it's just IPv4, but longer, so they don't have to worry about running out of address spaces. But we're working with IPv4. So we're gonna go before, and we're going to add that ENS18 or whatever your uh, network interface was. We're going to save it, but we're not going to exit quite yet because we still need to help this configuration file find it, its. We need to help the ISC at, uh, server find the configuration file for itself. We'll just uncomment this dhcpdv4 underscore conf. Control S, Control X. Easy enough. Now, theoretically speaking, hopefully, uh, first off, let's clear out the terminal. You can use the clear commands. If your terminal ever gets ugly like that, it just brings you to the top, nice and easy. Now we're going to restart the ISC DHCP server service, and we're going to be restarting network. We'll start just restarting networking, uh, system, CTL, uh, restart, networking. Perfect. System, CTL, start, ISC-DHCP, and if you're like me, very lazy, you don't want to complete the rest of this command, you just hit tab and it tries to autocomplete. And in this case, it fails, which is very sad. But we start the ISC DHCP server, and as you can see, it gives no complaints. We pull up IPA, our DHCP server is still at this inet 192.168.1.1, perfect. 
Let's go to the workstation. We'll sign in. Once again, Mr. Desmond Skatop's password is desktop because I have way too much fun with trying to name the desktop people actual names. Now we'll open up terminal. You can either do this manually, click on show applications, terminal, or the way cooler way, right click on the backgrounds and open in terminal. And it actually opens you to your desktop, funnily enough. Uh, we'll just run that IPA command. And you'll see, we're not actually set up with anything because we haven't actually changed which DHCP server we're using right now. This, I mean, it's on the same network, but it doesn't know what to do. So here, we're going to need to go into essentially a client uh, version of DHCP uh, in order to get it. Although, I'd like to check on the NAS. System, CTL, restart networking. IPA. Oh, something you'll also notice, ENS 18 is in state down. Let me check that on the uh, DHCP server. So basically that means the interface isn't running. It's not up, it, it's not trying anything. It's just running that loopback address. Here, you'll see state up because on the DHCP server, it's running. So we go back to the NAS server. And I believe it'd be what? IP link set ENS 18. Again, IP is a whole suite of tools. In this case, we're trying to set something to up. IPA, perfect, yeah. IP link sets our interface ENS 18 up. It goes up and it's still, you know, it doesn't know where to look for that DHCP server. And so, We got to set the DHCP server again using a configuration file here. We'll change directories into the slash etc folder. You'll see a whole bunch of folders in here. We'll see this DHCP server. We'll go into that one. And you'll see dhclients.com. As you might imagine, dhclient is our DHCP client machines uh, you know, configuration file. So we'll nano dhclients.com. And again, we love DHCP because it gives us this wonderful example file. And what we specifically want to do is essentially supersede whatever it's trying to access for a DHCP service to our actual DHCP server. And you'll see this uh, supersede domain name. Again, we don't have a domain. We don't, give, we don't care about domains right now. So we'll uncomment that out and replace it with supersede, I'm gonna say DHCP server, and then 192.168. Dot one, dot one, which was the address we statically assigned to our DHCP machine. That should be good. We'll save, we'll exit. And so I'll just write it again. System control, restart networking. IPA. Hmm.
and it's still not quite contacting our IP, our uh, DHCP server. Now, uh, just to test the connection, we're going to ping that DHCP server, 192.168.1.1. Network is unreachable, interesting. Now, my guess here would be there we have a closed port on our host firewalls. So uh, we check that uncomplicated firewall. Uh, we don't have that installed right now. Uh, uncomplicated firewall basically is just a management layer that pens itself on top of a host firewall service known as IP tables. IP tables identify certain things like Where's this piece of data coming from? Where's it going to? What services is it using? What port is trying to access? Do we let it in or do we block it? All right, interestingly enough, I can ping 192.168.1.50. And it's returning. Now this is from the DHCP machine. Now it does look like the DHCP server did assign .50 to itself. If you look hmm. back up at IPA. Now, I'm wondering if on the NAS server, if you need to double check with network interfaces on that ENS for the NAS, I'm wondering if it's not configured because sometimes you got to get it set up there too. So even though we set it, we, we, we set it up, uh, sometimes that, that gets a little finicky. Well, let's go back into that slash X slash network slash interfaces page. No, yeah, no, that's okay. It seems to be work. Interesting. Hmm. We'll clear out of that. Now you'll notice I used for the DHCP server this trace route or this trace, uh, yeah, trace route command. Basically, records when we send out a packet to the specific IP address. How is it getting there? Like, what stops is it taking? And so it goes and it just lands immediately at one nine two dot one six eight dot one dot fifty. Try fifty one. It also lands there immediately. Try 1.10. Hmm. Let's look into our uh, configuration files here. We might have something incorrect there. Actually, let's use journals control. So in the same way we have system control, we have this journal CTL. 
Uh, now that just records happenings, goings on, what is going on when there's a DHCP request. So we can check that. Journal CTL dash XC to get recent events. And it's getting requests from, interesting. It seems that we can see here, so a little bit about DHCP protocol. It starts with a DHCP discover, which is basically, you know, a computer says, hey, I am here. Here's a few a bit of information about me. Uh, and, it, and I want an IP address. DHCP then offers it an IP address and then it either accepts or rejects it with an acknowledgement. Uh, and then the DHCP server acknowledges the acknowledgement. So we see both a DHCP request for 192.168.1.51 from this MAC address, from desktop standard PC i440fx-piix-996 via ENS18. It sort of sounds uh, like our workstation. Uh, now this, you know, desktop standard, whatever, that's uh, that's our desktop name. Now our DHCP server's name, I believe is just DHCP machine. But if we go into our workstation and we sign in, yeah, this is exactly what it is. And we go in and we see that our ENS18 has in fact gotten a uh, IP address automatically assigned to it from the range we specified, 192.168.1.51, which gives some questions for what's happening with the NAS box. Uh, so it seems, you know, the desktop machine managed to automatically find itself a way to connect to the DHCP server, request an IP address, one was provisioned to it, and it is now you know, able to contact the DH, DHCP server. Let's go back to that NAS box. Once again, it still doesn't have any IP address. And we saw, we checked the configuration file in the NAS box. It looked fine. It was trying to ask, ask for a DHCP server. Hmm. Let us try once again. Let's ping 192. Let's ping the desktop 192.168.1.51. Connect. Network is unreachable. Hmm. System control starts. Network. Ping. Network is still unreachable. Interesting. I wonder if journal CTL or sometimes doing a restart. Might yeah, we'll, do it. We'll, we'll check with journal CTL dash, dash XE once again to get recent happenings. The last one, 2051. That'd be 851 for basic cleaning operations. This isn't what we want. That doesn't help us at all. Huh. We're telling it as we're expecting. All right, let's clear that out. I'm almost worried that this might be something to do with certain NASBOX service. We'll do system CTL and check the status of the NAS service. The network attack service, much like DHCP, is running its own little service. Open media vaults. I'm going to type in one of those long things. Hmm. 
Maybe try the engine one, yeah. Yeah, all right, so that's running as expected. Well, let's restart that. Well, let's restart the machine as a whole. It never hurts to turn it off and on again. Alternatively, we can all just we all we can also check out the uh, the MAC address that we used on the um, DHCP server as well. That's also true. So you know, we'll just shut it down manually. Interesting. Sometimes it's really weird with these. Sometimes rather than using shutdown or reboot, you should use um, stop. Well, it worked there. Oh, there it is. Okay, there we go. Finally. <laughs> and we'll just boot into it. You can see it's running on DB in here. Welcome to Grub. Thanks, Scrub. All right. What's the login? Admin NAS. Root NAS. Perfect. All right. IPA. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Just cries of turning it off and on again. Always try it. Always try it. Now, let's talk about what might actually occur in a competition here. Uh, now, I know we're running a little low on time here, but don't worry, this will be quick. Uh, because unfortunately for us, or fortunately, however you try and decide it, a DHCP's attack surface, or what you can actually use to get, or in this case, specifically, what we can use to actually get into the network, what we can actually use to try and insert ourselves in, it's pretty limited. Uh, really, DHCP is susceptible for, to what happens either A, once you get in the network, or B, you know, the attacks, are, the attacks against DHCP are generally solved versus using other services. So that would include a router, a switch, uh, something, you know, uh, there's something known as a DHCP flood attack, where you basically try and get the DHCP server to give you all of its available IP addresses. You would you can put a you know way of detecting that on your switch, which is just a thing that routes packets from uh, you know you want to go uh, from this machine to this machine on the network, and it does that effectively. Um, but we need a switch for that. We don't have one. We have a DHCP machine, a workstation, and a NAS box. So what I want to show you is instead what's known as backing up your configuration files. Now, something that red teams love to do, especially in competitions, is just very minorly screw with your configuration files, or just, you know, majorly. Uh, I remember during uh, the CCDC, which is a defensive competition that we have in the spring that you should totally join because it's a lot of fun. Uh, there were some teams that... Um, uh, they, they really, they gauge your attack based on how well they think you were doing. And so uh, while some teams received minor configuration changes that drove them nuts because they couldn't, they just couldn't eke it out. Uh, I remember some teams just had their bin slash SH directory fully deleted and then have it backed up. And what that meant is that bin slash SH is basically what contains all of the commands you use in Linux. LS, CD, MV. Once that was deleted, they, they were really kind of locked out of their machine because uh, they didn't have a, a way to get back into that, which is both very funny and kind of, kind of, kind of worrying. So 
imagine right now that the red team has managed to get into our network. They know what our DHCP server is and they're going to get into it and they're going to delete the configuration files because, you know, they're going slightly easy on us. Not easy enough to just make it a minor edit, but, you know, enough to delete it. So we want to be able to try and bring it back if that happens. So let's go on to our DHCP server. Uh, let's change into that slash, let's go into that, you know, slash at slash DHCP, DHCPD.com. So change directory from the root into slash X for files that change, but not that often, you know, like configuration files into the DHCP subfolder into DHCP daemon.com. Not a directory. Sorry, we'll go into the directory that dhcpd.com is actually in. LS. There it is. In any case, we're going to use the copy command to copy a version of what we currently have and we know is working and is correct using cp copy. <clears throat> we'll type in the full name of the what we want to copy. So we can either do that from the present working directory using this dot slash that basically says in the current working directory, I want the file dhcpd.conf. And then we got it, we're going to copy it. Where are we going to copy it to? And what are we going to name it? We can name it the same thing, or we can change where we put it. Uh, we can put it both in this individual directory, but that's sort of eggs in one basket. So Normally, you may, you might want to make your own directory for backups. For simplicity's sake, we'll just use this directory for now. And we'll go from the root to slash x for files of change, but not that often, to DHCP for DHCP-related files. We're going to name it dhcpd.conf.backup. We're going to ls. You'll see that dot backup. We're going to look at what that is. DHCP, the dot com dot backup. It's the exact same thing that we just had. Now, you might be thinking, you know, if they're in our machine and they are able to delete the dot com, surely they can just delete the dot backup as well. And that's true, which is why we want to do what's known as changing the file permissions. Now, in Linux, you can set permissions for different users at different things. So while our DHCP user account that's actually running this might become, you know, attacked and taken over by the red team, we can actually have it so that this, while it can still access the files it needs to, the copies, I mean, it doesn't need to use those. We can set that to only be accessible to the root user. Now we're going to use this using chmod, change, modifi change modification. CH mod. It's um, used for setting file permissions. If you've ever made a bash script in Linux, you'll know you have to do this plus X to indicate we can execute this uh, file. But for now, we're going to actually set it to a number. We're going to set change mod of the backup file dot slash hcpd.conf.backup. And we're going to change it to a number. Where am I? We're going to use the number 600. Now, Linux file permissions are often doled out using these numbered systems. 600 basically just means only the root user can read and write this file. There's more permissive permissions. There's more, you know, uh, like 777 means that any single user could read, write, execute. Uh, it's, it's sort of dependent thing to thing, uh, you know, number to number. We can open up the man pages for change mod. We can see a whole bunch of information about that right now. And it does actually get into which number, uh, under the impression it would get under into which numbers is which. Uh, it does right here. I, one to four octal digits derived by adding up the bits with values four, two, and one. So you can sort of see the uh, you know description here. But six run or six hundred basically means only root can look and use this. So 
If we go into the uh, user that we originally set using su DHCP admin, look inside this file, obviously dhcp.conf.backup, and we try and nano dhcpd, dhcpd.conf.backup. We don't see it. We can't read it because permission is denied. We're not actually allowed to read or write to it. So that's, <clears throat> that's that. Now we might just want to try and concatenate it out using the cat commands. Still says permission denied. This is perfect. Uh, what if we don't want them to see it at all? Now, you can't really, you know, what we're going to do isn't really perfect, but it's a nice trick to know, especially in competition environments. So we're going to elevate ourselves back up to root so we can access that file again. Using su, then nothing else to switch user into the root machine. Using password DHCP, which is the same. Not normally. We just made it like that for simplicity's sake. First of all, ls. We're going to cat DHCP D dot conf dot backup. You can see we can do that when we're. Uh, we can actually rename that using the move command. You can use the move command to rename things because you know. It, Sort of is what, basically what you're doing is you're saying, I want to move the file to here, or, you know, from this address with this name to the same place, but with this name. So MV, the current file, dhcpd.conf.backup to dot slash dot dhcp.conf.backup. And if we do ls, we no longer see it because it's hidden. Basically, Linux has that, you know, you'll see me use this dot and dot dot, uh, the dot signifying the current directory, dot dot signifying the directory above you. Because of that, those are technically directories that you could list, but Linux by default isn't actually going to show them because why would it show you that? So if we do instead list all of the things, including the hidden directories, those ones that Theoretically, we'd already know about. We see, well, we can see it now, but, you know, I mean, it's it's something to uh, be aware of. Now, in using this backup, let's imagine that Red Team hates us. They just delete the dhcpd.com folder. rm-f, force it. rm is the remove command. dhcpd.conf. LS, no, it's not there anymore. So let's say our workstation is here and, you know, it reboots or, you know, it has some hiccup in network and it tries to ask for another IP. So system control networking restart networking. And it's asking us to, you know, authenticate because Ubuntu tries to be more graphical, you know. All right, we can uh, we can do this manually by just we can't do this man. Oh, that's annoying. There we go. DH client is the DHCP client command line interface. Dash R basically just means abandon my lease. And if we do IPA, it's still there. It remembers it in cache. But let's try and get it to just reboot. But essentially, whenever we have a new machine, it's it's not going to work. It's not going to function. Uh, because, of course, you know, DHCP daemon doesn't have anything to go off of when it tries to request something. I'll wait for it to boot in.
We'll log into Desmond Skatop with his password, desktop. We're going to use a super cool right click on the background to open in terminal to open the desktop and terminal. We're going to use that IPA command. And it still remembers it. God damn it, Ubuntu. Stop being helpful. Uh, we'll try and run the sudo dh client, which will uh, try and renew our uh, IP address. And it still manages to get one. All right, I think we have to restart the DHCP server in order to break it. I love how tr hard we're trying to break our own system. System control. ISC dash system control restarts ISC dot DHCP dash server and the server failed and if we try and do status look at that it failed now let's try that again on the workstation We're gonna go for the DH client and it's freezing up here. It doesn't it's it's trying to do what it thinks it does, but it can't do it. So if you notice this happening in a competition environment, uh you know, any sort of no networks can't communicate to each other, and especially if you ever see the numbers 169 in an IP address, there is what's known as the APIPA range, the automatic provisioning of IP addressing. It's a special reserve set of IP addresses that if your network is, if your computer is trying to communicate somewhere and it just can't, it basically just generates a random number to append to this 169. It's technically 169 dot something, but, um, you know, ever, at least I can only, I'm only bothered to remember the 169 because no one ever uses that as their home networking plan or their business networking plan, because that would be deeply confusing. Um, So if you ever see that and your machines can barely communicate to each other and not to the internet and your services are down, the problem is probably with DHCP. You might try and DH client to restart your, you know, regain that lease. You'll notice it freezes up like this. It's failing. It ain't going to get better. It's just using the best, you know, the last IP address it knew. And so we can go back to here. We can try and bring up or restart the DHCP servers. We see it's failed. We'll use journal CTL real quick. I promise this won't take long. We'll notice can't open slash no such file or directory for the configuration file. We thought we made that. We thought we set that, but this will let us know to check. So we check slash cat slash et cetera slash DHCP slash DHCP. You know, slash, you know, we'll, we'll list everything there instead of trying to concatenate a specific file. And once you know it, it's not there. Red team is in our system. They deleted our stuff. That's terrible. But because we came prepared with that backup system, we can just copy it over. Dot slash dot DHCP dot comp dot backup to dot slash DHCP D dot comp ls look at that it's returns we'll restart that system and it goes through without a hitch and sorry just to uh show the nas box it's very simple we go to a web browser and this will be the final thing i swear it, it'll take like two minutes if that the reason we want to keep that NASBOX IP address static is because we're going to have to remember it to type it in. 192.168.1.10. And 
and it brings us to the NAS box, which is services up and running. So that's basic intro to DHCP, you know, standalone DHCP, how to set it up, how to you know have a backup and how to troubleshoot problems when things go wrong. I appreciate all of you for showing up and anyone who's watching asynchronously. Uh, does anyone have any questions at all about DHCP, about the setup, about you know what might happen? Come up open media vaults, little animation there. All right. I'll take that as uh, no questions necessary, but um, if you ever have any, of course, feel free to post them in the Discord. There's tons of people out there with a lot of experience in competitions, in actual work environments, uh, in probably a good couple of penetration tests. Uh, you could probably you could ask questions about how to break into DHCP, how to use DHCP, how to better protect certain elements of DHCP. And you might remember we talked a bit about services that can protect DHCP servers that aren't necessarily on the DHCP service. We will go over that as like a general network security. But that'd be all for me. Unless. All right. Oh, it's, you know, glad to learn I helped. I was informative. Thank you for coming on. All righty. Thanks so much for joining us today. And, and thank you so much, Nick, for putting that together for us. Uh, next week, we'll have Ben, and he'll be doing something related to offensive security. We don't know quite yet, but uh, next week will be Ben again, and he'll be doing some offensive security stuff. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing everybody again next week, and uh, have a great evening, everybody.